From Luke chapter 12, hear the word of the Lord. I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They'll be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it's going to rain, and so it happens. When you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Be you may be seated. Sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. My sermon is based on our second lesson from Hebrews chapters 11 to 12. Uh, and these stories of the heroes of the faith. Uh, in chapter 11, it starts with Abraham and talking about Abraham's faith. And then as we get into our lesson, it starts talking about Moses and how uh, the Israelites by faith went through the Red Sea. And it was by faith that the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. And if you think that you have to be an Abraham or a Moses, you're mistaken. You don't even have to be a man of God, a uh, woman of God, right? And most of the people, the heroes of my faith, uh, have been women. Uh, you don't have to be a prophet or a priest to be a hero of the faith. In fact, you can be a prostitute. One of the great heroes of the faith was Rahab the prostitute, this woman of God, who by faith took in the, the spies from Israel and held them safe and dis distracted uh, the people of Israel from being uh, murdered. And it was by faith that we get this list of, of heroes of the faith. You got Deborah, who was a judge, and Gideon, and, and there was Barak, and there was Samson, there was Jephthah, there was David, there was Samuel, and the list goes on and on and on. That's just in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you got Peter, you got Paul, James, John, Mary, Martha, and the list goes on and on. And that's just biblical people. And then throughout history, you got these heroes of the faith, right? I mean, we're sitting in a Lutheran church. We sing a mighty fortress. So you got to talk about Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther, who by faith took a stand and said, Here I stand. I can do no other. Upon the word of God, upon the gospel, calling, even if it's going to divide the church, calling the church to repentance, calling the people who were in positions of power and privilege, priests, to repentance against the people. Uh, you had his namesake, Martin Luther King Jr., who was willing to take a stand and call a nation to repentance, even if it divided the nation, so that the voiceless might have a voice, so that, uh, that the people of privilege and power might be called to repentance, right? You have Dietrich Bonhoeffer taking a stand and, and against the Nazis and the scapegoating of a people, uh, the Jews, the crimes against humanity, the hatred that was being spewed. He took a stand. You have Nelson Mandela, you got Gandhi, you got Malala Yousafzai, is that how you pronounce her name? You've got uh, uh, Rosa Parks and Melinda Gates, and I mean, the list goes on and on of people who have the courage and the willingness to risk even their own well being to make a change in society, to call people to repentance, to speak for God, right? One of the greatest stories, one of my favorite, is the story of a woman named Esther. Now Esther was a Hebrew woman, Jewish, who became a queen, not the queen, a queen, a part of the harem for the king who has, was over the king of Persia from India to Egypt, including Israel. And she became a part of the harem. Now, women, even though a queen sounds like a lofty title, they really didn't have any power whatsoever. 
And as part of the, the harem, a queen needed to know the rules. And one of the rules was you don't go and talk to the king. The king talks to you. You don't call upon the king. The king calls upon you, right? Well, Esther had an uncle named Mordecai. And Mordecai was this devout Jew, a man of God. And, and there was a man named Haman who was the right-hand man to the king. And Haman uh, pretty much was the chief operating officer of the whole kingdom and, and was expanding the realm. And so the king pretty much gave him free reign. Haman had uh, let the power go to his head. And when he walked into a room or walked into a city, he expected everybody to bow down like he was some sort of God. Now Mordecai, being a man of God, bowed to no one except Yahweh, right? And so word got back to Haman that this guy named Mordecai, because of his faith as a Jew... Uh, would not bow down to Haman. And so Haman ended up hating not just Mordecai, but all the Jews, and he devised a plan to exterminate all the Jews. Sound familiar? Mordecai had an in, he thought, with the king. His niece, Esther, was part of the harem. So he goes to Esther and he says, Esther, you have to speak to the king on behalf of your people. Mordecai is devising a plan to annihilate all the Jews, all the Hebrews. You have to speak to the king. Esther says, I can't. To go and speak to the king, to call upon the king, is against the rules. If I do that, I'll be put out on the street as a prostitute or uh, they may just kill me. It's not allowed. I can't do that. And Mordecai says to Esther, perhaps it's for such a time as this that you're being called. Perhaps it's for such a time as this that you're being called. It isn't going to be easy. It isn't going to be comfortable. It may be risky, it may be dangerous, it may cost you everything, but perhaps for such a time as this, you're being called. I remember some years ago when we had the internship program and we were working with St. Peter and we, we were doing that. You remember that? Yes. For those who were around? Uh, we had in the fall and in the spring a supervisor intern retreat with all the other supervisors and interns in the region and we would gather somewhere and, and talk about ministry and blah, 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 you know. And, and, uh, and I remember distinctly going on one of these retreats and all of the supervising pastors who had been in ministry for a couple of decades, you know, and uh, who were the veterans, we were sitting around kibitzing and we were moaning and groaning about the state of the church, you know, how when we were growing up, the the culture catered to the church. Society catered to, to the church. You had Sundays, there wasn't anything going on on Sunday mornings and maybe even Wednesday nights. Did you grow up in a time when Wednesday night was church night and there wasn't anything on Wednesday nights, really? Some of you that young? Uh, and and uh, I, I don't remember that. But I, I remember Sunday mornings. There'd be nothing on Sunday mornings, right? And, and, uh, and now today, you know, there's, nobody cares. Sunday morning, Wednesday night, it doesn't matter. There's all sorts of other things that you could be doing and that you're called upon to do, right? Whether it's work, whether it's kids' sports, whether it's whatever. And uh, the, the church society just doesn't cater to Christianity and to the church. Uh, and, and we're moaning and groaning about this change and, you know, it isn't what I signed up for and the church has changed, the world has changed and what's going on and it's going to hell in a handbasket, yada, yada, yada. And as we're kibitzing about this, moaning and groaning, one of the young interns interrupts and says, you know, I didn't grow up in that church. This is the church I know. This is what I signed up for. Pretty much silenced the room, right? <laughs> It's Mordecai saying to Esther, perhaps for such a time as this we're being called, huh? It's not easy. It's not comfortable. It's not going to do any good to sit around and moan and groan about those days gone by. They're gone. They're by. This is what we're called to. It's not easy being a Christian today. Maybe it's not supposed to be. If you want to sit around and mope and moan and groan about what it used to be, well, so what? That doesn't help today. It's not easy being a Christian today. It requires sacrifice. There is a calling to this. It requires a commitment to follow Jesus, to be a part of His church and His ministry in the world today. It requires some conviction that this actually matters and is important more so than other things that call upon us. It requires some compassion 
as we go about this calling. The courage to speak, the courage to stand up for our faith, but to do it with compassion. It requires repentance and repenting from buying into all the ways of the world and actually following Jesus, taking up our cross. It's not easy. But perhaps for such a time as this, you're being called, huh? Jesus says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest send out laborers. Today we're sending somebody out. <laughs> Actually, we're all being called out. But we are sending Taryn and Corinne out. Taryn and Corinne are going off for a year of internship to Vancouver, Washington. And, and uh, we're sending Taryn out for this year of training to be a pastor in a congregation doing pastor stuff. And, and if Taryn is at all like me, which thank God he's completely different, but... I, but I think there are some things that everybody going on an internship probably experiences, right? Um, there's probably some fear and trembling about what will I say, how will I do, uh, will I have the courage, will I have the conviction, will I be able to carry the cross? And I want to tell you, Taryn, what Jesus told his disciples. When they were wondering... And I'm, am I going to be able to carry the cross? Am I going to be able to follow Jesus? Am I going to be able to, to have the courage or the conviction to, to witness? Jesus said to them, Don't worry about what you will say when you're called before the people. The Holy Spirit will come and God will give you the word. Right? Every day you're going to be put in the situation where the cross is going to be given to you. You don't need to go looking for it. It's going to come to you. God's going to provide you the opportunities <laughs> that aren't going to be comfortable or easy to be a Christian in the world today. Don't worry about what you'll say or how you'll do. God will give you the word. We wonder, how do I get such faith? How do I get such courage? How do I get such conviction like Deborah or Esther or Abraham or Moses? You don't have to get it. It's something God will give. And in those times, if you're like me and look back at all the times when I think I've failed to do so, well, here's the good news for you. By the mercy and grace of God, you're forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ and God is going to give you more opportunities. God's going to give you the cross to bear. And if you wonder if you're going to be able to do it, well, Joshua 1.9, don't be afraid or dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be a strong and of good courage, people. Huh? So, Taryn, God is going to go with you and God is going to provide the way out, but you got to know <laughs> the way out is through the valley of the shadow of death and God preparing a table in the presence of your enemies. You don't get Easter without Good Friday. You don't get the way out without going through the cross. But God will raise you up. The Lord God be with you all. Amen. Amen.